And welcome to our worship this morning. Gosh, I sound loud. <laughs> That's a bit terrifying. <laughs> I worked out that it's been three years since I stood up here uh, and led you all in worship. I think there was one occasion when I led um, when we were live streaming, so there were very few people here. Um, this feels a bit like going back to the beginning, about the first day at school, um, or even going back to school after a long, protracted... I, I know most of you very, very well, uh, very familiar faces, some new ones, and uh, that's absolutely lovely. But I have to admit that I am ever so slightly terrified standing up here, and I don't know quite why. But I'm here. God has brought me here. So, let us start in prayer. Almighty God, you go on and on and on forever and ever. You are very wise, powerful, and full of love. We praise you for who you are and for what you do for our whole world. When you gave us Jesus to be our friend, brother, and savior, you showed us what we mean to you and your never-ending love for us. Help each of us, Lord, to worship you as we should, with the help of your spirit, to always be truthful and wholehearted in our worship of you. Amen. So let us do that now. Let us worship the Lord in scripture, prayer, and song. Good morning, everybody. Please be standing for the first line of this song. We stand and lift up our hands. We stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down and worship Him now How great, how awesome is He And together we sing Everyone sing Holy is the Lord filled with his glory holy is the lord god almighty the earth is filled with his glory the earth is filled with his glory we stand and lift up our hands for the joy of the lord is our strength we bow down and worship him now How great, how awesome is he And together we sing Everyone sing Holy is the Lord, God Almighty The earth is filled with his glory Holy is the Lord God Almighty, the earth is filled with His glory, the earth is filled with His glory, it's rising up, it's all around, it's the anthem of the Lord's renown, it's rising up, it's all around, it's the anthem of the Lord's renown. And together we sing, everyone sing. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. The earth is 
filled with His glory. The earth is filled with His glory. Please remain standing. as gold and precious silver purify my heart let me be as gold pure gold refine as fire my heart's one desire is to be holy set apart for you Lord I choose to be holy set apart for you my master ready to do your will purify from within and make me holy purify my heart cleanse me from my sin deep within refine as vile my heart's one desire is to be holy set apart for you Lord I choose to be holy set apart for you my master ready to do your will ready to do your is built on nothing less than Jesus blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly trust in Jesus name my hope is built I'm nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone. In the Savior's love, through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on His unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within veil. My anchor holds within veil. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, 
shall come with trumpet sound oh may I then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone faultless and stand before the throne Christ the Lord cornerstone in the Savior's love Through the storm He is Lord, Lord of all Christ alone Cornerstone Weak made strong In the Savior's love Through the storm he is Lord, Lord of all. Thank you, Keith. Christ alone made cornerstone and the words of purify my heart if you've got a hymn book then do open it up at that one I don't think any of you will have don't worry um, but I, I as is the way with all these things I can't remember the exact words now and we've just sung them <laughs> but those words in purify my heart uh, are really resonate with what I hope uh, we're going to say today. So, Tracy, would you like to come and talk to us? amazing that's my favorite kind of sound live music you just can't beat it I also love to hear the sound that comes from the kids corner over there every week I really hope you can all hear it it's a wonderful sound now sound is something we all make isn't it when we're sleeping we may make a light breathing sound or we might even snore when we yawn that's it John just like that when we yawn we might make a sound what other types of sounds do we make yeah, not what, not what sounds animals make. What sounds do we make? Any other sounds, anybody? Orange. 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 Okay, shall I help you out? We might make a sound when we cough or when we sneeze. George, what sounds do we make? Stomping. We make stomping sounds. We make sounds when we talk. Oh, they're all off now. Anyway. Did you know that you can actually see sound, not just hear it? You can actually see it too. Now, I do have to warn you, this might be quite loud, so I'm warning you in advance, okay? I've got a bowl here with some cling film on, and I'm going to put some rice on top of it. Just a little bit. We don't want rice flying all around the church, do we? It's not a wedding. Okay. So what I'm going to do is bang this tray beside it. So please, if you have a problem with this, then yeah, put your fingers in your ears, because it is going to make a sound. Now, I'm not going to touch the bowl, and I'm not going to touch the rice, OK? I'm just going to bang it and watch the sound, rice move through the sound waves. Ready? Did you see that? No, not No, you definitely would. Come nearer, John. Ready? I saw a bit. 
wobble, but it went back still. But it wasn't still, was it? It moved without me touching it. Okay, go and sit back down, John. Go and sit back down. Bang as hard as you can. Are you ready? <laughs> see, that didn't work so well. I think just the bang like that and you can see it move, okay? So it was just the sound waves in the air that made that happen. Now, some of you will remember the last time I was up here, I had some really special help, some extra special help. Who remembers who that was? Us! Who was it? One of you, but you're not, he's not here today. I had Spider-Man help me. Sorry, Jess, sorry. <laughs> And Spider-Man is a superhero. Now, did you know that the Bible is full of superheroes? Did you know that? It is, and some of them are really, really young, just like you. Like David. Yes, David's one he of them. He can fly when he's only a little boy. Yes, and we're going to learn about that upstairs. I know but, that. Yeah, cool. But the superhero we're going to hear about today is a Bible character we don't really know her name. We just know that she was a little girl. Okay? I personally want to call her Supergirl because she was very, very brave. She was brave because she made a sound. She said something that caused a stir. She made things move. So she was just a little servant girl in a big house that belonged to a mighty warrior called Naaman. Now, he may have been a mighty warrior, but he had a big problem. He had leprosy. It does. Well, I think you might notice, but yeah, things just fall off of you, don't they? So obviously, he didn't want to have leprosy, and because eventually he knew that he would die, and he didn't want to die. He wanted to be healed. So the girl, the girl knew somebody that could heal him, and that's the same person that you know. That's right, John, she knew God. Now here is where the bravery comes in, because remember, she's just a little girl in a big house where nobody would have taken any notice of her at all. Nobody. She would have been really, really frightened to speak up. But more than anything, in the whole world, she wanted her master to be healed. She wanted him to be all better. She just had to find her voice and like the rice, make the sound make waves move. So remember, she was only little, but she was really brave. And you can be brave too. You can all be superheroes. You can. And with God's help, you can tell all of your friends about Jesus and the amazing thing that he did for us. Okay, now my... my yes, now my, my talk was supposed to finish there, but when I was preparing it, sorry, Sarah, but you know how God is. When I was preparing it, he put a conversation on my mind that I'd had a few weeks ago. Unfortunately, little Clemmy isn't here today, but I was speaking to him and his mum at the end of his church, and she asked him to tell me what he did at school, what he'd been doing at school. So there I was, waiting to hear a message about his amazing English or maths. It wasn't anything like that. I'm getting choked, sorry. It wasn't anything like that at all. Him and his little friend sit in the hall every day before lunch and they say grace. That's the kind of kids that we have. We have to really nurture them and their families. We really do because my prayer is that in a few years' time, when Kemi is in secondary school, that we've done our job, that we've made them feel really special and welcome and that he will feel confident enough to still, still sit in that dining hall, a lot bigger than the one he's in now, and still be able to say grace. That's my prayer. Thank you. I'll clear this up after. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tracy. A wonderful reminder that uh, the grace of God works through us all, whatever age, wherever we are. And now uh, the children are going to uh, go out to their groups. Tracy's now running to, to get rid of the microphone so she can go with them. So let us pray for them just before they go. Um, Lorna, I know, has been encouraging us to uh, reach out our, arm, our hands to them if you want to, so please do so. Um, but let's pray for them. Father, we thank you for the blessing of children. We thank you for the blessing of the noise and of uh, the excitement that they bring. 
And Lord, as they go out to their groups, we pray that uh, that excitement will go with them, that it will encourage them to learn, to know about you, and to then take you with them when they go out into the world. Lord, we pray for their leaders and for the parents. And thank you, Lord, for the blessing of children. Amen. As they go out, and just before Audrey comes up to lead our prayers of, uh, in session, I would um, just like to highlight something on the uh, notice sheet that Lorna asked me to highlight, which is the prayer walk on the 3rd of July. Uh, it's at 2.30 p.m., uh, thereabouts, uh, and what we're looking for is, is groups of three, at least, uh, walking around the, your local areas, uh, uh, praying at various points for Whittam, uh, for the people who live there and the work that goes on there. Um, you can also join in at home by using a map provided by Lorna, I understand, covering your local area and praying for the highlighted areas if you can't uh, get out and walk. Um, as it says in the, in the notice sheet at the moment, there's only one group of three walking. So please um, think about this. Prayer underpins and intertwines with all that we do and all that God does through us. Uh, so please think about joining in with this important ministry and contact Lorna soon to say, yes, you will be involved. Okay, Audrey. At the end of each section of our prayers of intercession this morning, I will allow for a time of silence when we can offer up our own prayers silently to God. So let us bring our needs and the needs of others to God our Father. Lord of creation, thank you for this beautiful planet we call home. Father, we admit to sometimes missing the glory and the grandeur of your created world we can walk through life with our senses turned off. Help us to see all things shot through with your glory. The morning sun between the houses, the beautiful shapes, colors, and smells of plants and trees, the endless shades of darkness in an evening sky. Help us to be good stewards of all you have given us. We remember before you the world's joyful diversity and its desperate needs. Peace-loving God, we pray for the places in our world where war is raging. We pray for all the leaders of our world to use their powers of persuasion to work for peace, justice and truth. We pray for all the innocent people affected by conflict that they will be treated with compassion and respect. Lord of the nations, we know that peace seems very far off in Ukraine, but in this world, surprise constantly catches us out. So Lord, we do dare to hope, bring peace in Ukraine and base that peace on justice.
God of compassion, we share the pain of the people of Afghanistan, suffering greatly after the devastating earthquake last Wednesday. Strengthen them at this time of great need, and may they receive the help that they need. We pray for our community and our loved ones. We pray for the young, the elderly, for families, and all who are alone. We pray that God will help us to recognize his image and likeness in all we meet. Heavenly Father, we remember before you our church community. We pray for a spirit of openness that we may listen to God's word and have the courage to put it into practice. We rejoice to see more children, young people and families joining in worship here. We delight in welcoming new people and seeing the centre come alive during the week. Show us, Lord, how to be a community of the friends of Jesus, blessed by that friendship and seeking to be a blessing to others. God of love, we share with you our love and concern for people in a bad place today. We have in our hearts those who are ill, those who are in a tight spot trying to make ends meet, those people whose relationships have fallen apart, and those who are struggling with mental health problems. Remind us, Father, that everyone is unique and valuable to you as the disciples were to Jesus. Each person is irreplaceable and each your beloved child. Finally, Heavenly Father, we share with you our love and concern for ourselves. For you commanded us to love our neighbor and ourselves equally. We offer to you our gratitude for so much and our need for so much. We thank you for particular things. And we ask you for particular things we truly need. Merciful Father, please take and use the tentative longings of our heart. Accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now let us say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. But 
deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, forever and ever. Amen. Over the last few weeks, we have been looking at a series of characters who have all been brave and stepped up to the plate to share their faith. This has not always been from a comfortable standpoint, a front line that is comfortable and homely or familiar to the character. And today's character that Tracy introduced us to, Naaman's wife's servant girl, is someone who is so far from her comfort zone that she is in a totally hostile environment. And yet, her faith shines through, and she sets an incredible chain of events in motion by being brave and speaking up. I'll read you her story, which is told at the beginning of the fifth chapter of the second book of Kings in the Old Testament. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation, and hopefully the words are on the screen. Thank you. So 2 Kings, chapter 5. The king of Aram had great admiration for Naaman, the commander of his army, because through him the Lord had given Aram great victories. But though Naaman was a mighty warrior, he suffered from leprosy. At this time... Aramean raiders had invaded the land of Israel, and among their captives was a young girl who had been given to Naaman's wife as a maid. One day, 
the girl said to her mistress, I wish my master would go to see the prophet in Samaria. He would heal him of leprosy. So Naaman told the king what the young girl from Israel had said. Go and visit the prophet, the king of Aram told him. I will send a letter of introduction for you to take to the king of Israel. So Naaman started out, carrying as gifts 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. The letter to the king of Israel said, with this letter, I present my servant Naaman. I want you to heal him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes in dismay and said, am I a god that I can give life and take it away? Why is this man asking me to heal someone with leprosy? I can see that he is just trying to pick a fight with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard the king of Israel had torn his clothes in dismay, he sent this message to him. Why are you so upset? Send Naaman to me and he will learn that there is a true prophet here in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and waited at the door of Elisha's house. But Elisha sent a messenger out to him with this message, go, go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River, then your skin will be restored and you will be healed of your leprosy. But Naaman became angry and stalked away. I thought he would certainly come out to meet me, he said. I expected him to wave his hands over the leprosy and call on the name of the Lord his God and heal me. Aren't the rivers of Damascus, the Abana, the, the Farpa better than any of the rivers of Israel? Why shouldn't I wash in them and be healed? So Naaman turned and went away in a rage. But his officers tried to reason with him and said, Sir, if the prophet had told you to do something very difficult, wouldn't you have done it? So you should certainly obey him when he says simply, go and wash and be cured. So Naaman went down to the Jordan River and dipped himself seven times as the man of God had instructed him. And his skin became as healthy as the skin of a young child and he was healed. Then Naaman and his entire party went back to find the man of God. They stood before him and Naaman said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please, accept a gift from your servant. But Elisha replied, As surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept any gifts. And though Naaman urged him to take the gift, Elijah refused. Then Naaman said, all right, but please allow me to load two of my mules with earth from this place, and I will take it back home with me. From now on, I will never again offer burnt offerings or sacrifices or any, to any other god except the Lord. However, may the Lord pardon me in this one thing, when my master, the king, goes into the temple of the god Rimon to worship there and leans on my arm, May the Lord pardon me when I bow too. Go in peace, Elisha said. So Naaman started home again. That's quite a long story. And uh, our servant girl only appears once right at the very beginning. On the surface, you might think, well, that wasn't a story about the servant girl. Rather, it's a story about the healing of Naaman and about Elisha, the prophet of the Lord, and about the politics of ancient Israel and its neighbors. After all, the servant girl doesn't even get a name, and she does only appear in one verse out of the 19 that I read. Oh, good, I can hear you thinking. A short sermon. <laughs> well, let's see if we can flesh it out. <laughs> Firstly, some historical background, um, and I think there is a, a map that um, I, oh, thank you, that I gave this morning. I, I think it always helps to have some geographical context, and those of you who know me know my husband is a geography teacher, so I can't help myself. <clears throat> the uh, Kingdom of Israel, uh, or the, 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 the country that we know of as Israel, has now split into two kingdoms, 
kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah that you can see there to the south where Jerusalem is. And the kingdom of Israel has its capital, Samaria. So it's, it's what becomes known as Samaria, the land of... <coughs> Sorry. The kingdom that uh, the servant girl and Naaman come from is the kingdom of Aram, or Aram, or uh, however you want to pronounce it, um, where the Arameans live. Although a lot of uh, Aramean tribes do live in the rest of this, uh, this area. And it's just at the top there, the, the blue, uh, with the capital of Damascus, which uh, we still know today. Uh, and as you can see, it borders on Israel um, just uh, by the, the other side of the Jordan. At the time that we're talking about, the people of Aram were uh, continually raiding uh, the um, Israelite kingdom, uh, were fighting with them, and would go on to fight with them for another 150 years after this time. Uh, Eventually, the nation was swallowed up by the Assyrian Empire, which uh, is, is sort of to the north and, and beyond, um, and it's large, and it's, it's what is known as Syria today. So that's a little bit of geographical context. Um, lost my notes. <laughs> The two kingdoms had separated, and the kingdom of Israel uh, had had nine kings up to this point. When this story takes place, which is around about 850 BC, 850 BC to 840 BC, um, so the ninth king is on the throne, uh, and he is mentioned in the story. Um, but they had uh, moved away from God. They had, while still believing, I think, in God, um, they were worshipping idols, they were um, uh, worshipping Baal um, and other gods, uh, and had turned away from their God and from uh, the, the, the chosen path that God had given them. God chose the descendants of Abraham to be a blessing to the fallen world to proclaim to them, the fallen world, the greatness of the living God. But by this stage, the separation that God had commanded for the Jews from what was seen as the uncleanliness of the world had evolved into a separation from all that was non-Jewish. So anything that was considered to... was They just kept themselves to themselves, and this idea of mission uh, had been totally lost. However, there were little pockets of, and, and as, as I've said, that, you know, they, they've moved on uh, and introduced uh, what essentially becomes spiritual idolatry within, um, within the, the, the kingdom. There were pockets, though, of people who still uh, believed, and it is probable that this servant girl came originally from uh, one of these families and within these pockets, so that she knew of Elisha, she knew of the prophet, she knew of God's healing love, she knew that it was her duty to speak of all these things wherever she was. And so to our servant girl, what was her name? We don't know. Andy, could you put the next picture up, please? Sometimes, this is a, a, a representation I found online. We don't know what she looked like, but sometimes it's good to have something, a picture in the imagination, so please do use that if you want to. We don't know what she was called. Like many of the people that we hear about um, that spread the word of God, they are anonymous. We don't know who they are specifically. 
We know when she lived because she knew Elisha, so we knew that she was, she was alive during his ministry, which, as I said, was 850 to 840 BC. We knew she was young, that she was a girl. That probably equates to uh, young being, uh, not necessarily just young in age, but um, diminutive in importance as well so that we know she was a serving girl. Uh, we know that she was a girl, um, and that can be any age from infancy to adolescence. I would say she was probably between 10 and 12, maybe. So much, much younger than all of us sitting here now. Um, and she was an Israelite. So she was resident in the Northern Kingdom. What happened to her? Well, she was taken prisoner by the Arameans, the Syrians, uh, during one of their marauding raids of Israel. It says so right at the beginning of, uh, in the first, ver no, second verse. At this time, Aramean raiders had invaded the land of Israel, and among their captives was a young girl who'd been given to Naaman's wife. So she was. She was a prisoner of war, essentially. Just stop and think about that for a moment. Can you imagine? We hear lots of stories of uh, refugees uh, torn from their homes, uh, particularly at the moment through war. Um, we have uh, amongst us, not here necessarily, but um, certainly in Essex, um, a lot of Ukrainian refugees now um, who are being welcomed into our homes. Um, people torn away from their homeland and from everything they know. And now imagine being 10 years old and having that done to you. I imagine she was extremely frightened, extremely lonely. I imagine that really all she wanted to do was to curl up and quite simply die without everything that she'd known. But what, what was her job? Why, why was she with them? She was the servant or serving girl to the wife of Naaman, who interestingly we don't get named either. So um, she served. She was always with her mistress. She was attentive to her. She probably performed household chores, cooking meals, bathing, dressing her mistress, and so on. But in all of that, she does seem to have had a special relationship to Naaman's wife because she could make suggestions to her. She could talk to her. There was an opening. So while she was terrified, I think she was probably treated kindly within uh, the bounds of being a servant, within the bounds of being a slave. And that's important, as you'll see later. There are many Despite the fact that she's only in one verse, there are many characteristics that we can pick out about her. And although she's only in one verse, she has such a huge impact for one so small and so young and so far from home. Her surroundings, I think, would have been quite nice because Naaman's household would have been a rich household. How much of that she was able to access as a slave, I don't know. Um, the rules of slavery were different in those days. You were able to uh, um, engage in uh, economic activity and so on and, and to eventually buy your freedom. But you were still a slave. You were still owned by your master. But Naaman, it seems, was a 
kind person. He was certainly revered and respected by his fellow countrymen. Um, and through that, she felt able to speak up. She was loyal to her master, to where she was. She found herself in a really difficult situation. She didn't rail against it, but she was able to be loyal to her master, and by that I mean her God, in everything she did whilst being enslaved. She was compassionate. She'd been snatched and taken away. She had no reason to show compassion, none whatsoever. But she was compassionate. She felt sorry for her master. She wanted to see him healed. Otherwise, she would not have spoken up. Leprosy is a difficult Difficult disease. Um, in the Bible, it is actually a term for, for all sorts of skin conditions, it, not just the, the leprosy that we think of today, uh, which is known as Hansen's disease. But it was regarded as a very serious threat to society in the Bible because everybody thought it was contagious. If you touch somebody that's got leprosy, you will get it, uh, you will be condemned. Um, and, and so that's why there are leper colonies, why people uh, are shunned from society and have to go and live somewhere else. So it was a very uh, difficult disease to have for this man who was uh, revered and who was um, a, a leader of his people. And the servant girl can see that distress and is trying very much to relieve it. I think it's also fair to say that she was trusted by her mistress. There was something about her, about the way she behaved, about her demeanor, about how she operated uh, as a slave girl, that meant that her mistress trusted her completely because her mistress is the one who goes and tells... She, she tells her mistress about Elisha, and then the mistress goes and tells Naaman, who then goes and tells the king, who then goes, and so on. So if they hadn't have trusted the servant girl in the first place, none of that would have happened. So there's something about the way that she behaves that makes her trustworthy. And she became a blessing to the place where she was, to the people that she was among. She had faith. She had faith. She had faith in the power of, the God, of God. She had faith in the power of the prophet, the power of the prophet Elisha particularly. She had faith in his power to heal Naaman. Just think about that for a moment. If you were in that situation and you said, oh, I know somebody who can heal you. Yep, yeah, it's, it's fine. You know, off you go. And this was a long way to travel. She was probably living in Damascus. And if you think about the map, they would have to travel two or three days at least uh, and then go and find Elisha. And they're going into a foreign land, um, a land that they have been fighting with for a very long time. So to risk all of that uh, on the say-so of a child, but for her to speak up in the first place and to show that much faith... If you said, oh yeah, I know somebody, I, I, they can heal you, I think I would be sitting there going, oh my goodness, I hope they do. I hope, what happens if, if I, I shouldn't say that, because they may not be healed, it may not work. It may, and then what happens to me afterwards? She may well have said those things to herself, but we, we don't know. But she had the faith to speak out. And her faith was effective. It generated hope. 
In that first verse, we hear that he suffered from leprosy. Uh, Naaman was a mighty warrior, but he suffered from leprosy. It's this huge thing. But it generated hope, what the, the servant girl said. Naaman's wife hoped in the truth and shared that hope with her husband. And then he shared it with his king, who really wanted to see this man healed because he was his faithful servant and, and friend and confidant and all that. And it gave Naaman hope of physical healing, that he could actually be well uh, and be back out doing his job. And because her faith was effective and she had faith, it opened up this opportunity to witness. By speaking out at the right time, she was able to witness to the power of God, to her own faith, uh, and to the faith of her people. And it set in motion this enormous chain of events that had ripples, more than ripples, tidal waves all throughout history. Naaman was healed. He was healed physically, but also spiritually. He accepted God as the one true God. He asked to be excused that he would have to go and bow to uh, the, the idol um, with his uh, master. But other than that, he was testifying at the end of that passage uh, to the fact that he now believed in God. One assumes that he went back, that he took command of his troops, that he spread that faith um, and, um, and that testimony throughout Syria through his soldiers. It is an incredible story. But what does it give us? We've been thinking about, obliquely perhaps, uh, front lines, our front lines, and how we behave, how we uh, transmit our testimony, how we um, tell people of the wonderful things that Jesus did for us. Those front lines are very different for each of us. So it is very hard to come up with, you must do A, B, C, and D. Uh, don't do E, uh, definitely bypass F, and come all the way back to A again when you start. It is actually very difficult to do that because our front lines are different, but they also change all the time, depending on where you are, what you're doing, who's with you, and how you're behaving. My front line over the last three years has changed enormously. Um, I'm still working for the church, for uh, the Church of England, uh, but I'm now in the Diocesan office, um, so uh, not at the retreat house anymore. Uh, and you would think that that as a front line would not be the same as, say, um, working in uh, an industry where there are um, no Christians, or I'm the only Christian in the office. Um, it's true, there are more Christians, and we do pray uh, a lot and we meet when we meet together. Um, but there are also non-Christians there. And even in amongst my own people, as it were, um, with Christians, you still have to behave on the front line as if you are a Christian, as if... Um, because otherwise, simply put, what is the point? What is the point of all this? A front line can be your home, it can be... Uh, it can be work, it can be um, sitting and having a coffee with friends, it can, be, it can be anywhere and everywhere. And if we don't behave as if we believe in Jesus and we know Jesus and 
the wonderful things he can do for us, then there is no point in being here in this church. This is not our front line. Our front line is out there. So like the servant girl who finds herself in this extraordinary situation, we must take the opportunity to share our faith out there. I would very much like to come up with <laughs> an A, B, C, and D, but I don't have those answers. I am reminded of the words of um, Paul to Timothy uh, in 1 Timothy 4.12. He says, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. Obviously, he's speaking to Timothy, who was young at the time. Um, but we can all, we are all young. We are young in our faith. We are young uh, in our relationship with God. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers. So for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. It's very easy to think about those things here in church. What we must do is to take them out there, carry them with us, and think about them out there, in and around our reactions with other people, with the world, with what's going on. Amen. We're going to sing again. I think it's a new one called God is for us. I'm not sure. I think it has been done before. Has it? Okay. Not by me though. So. <laughs> Apologies. Mm. Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now. No love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Our God is You will cheer me onward with never-ending grace. Sing with joy now, our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now, no love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? separate us hell and death will not defeat us he who gave his son to free us holds me in his love neither hide nor death can separate us hell and death will not defeat us he who gave his son to free us holds me in his love sing with joy now our god is for us the father's love is a strong and mighty fortress praise your voice now no love is greater who can 
and stand against us if our God is for us. Sing with joy now, our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now, no love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Father God, we thank you for the gifts that you have given us. Take this, our gifts, back to you. Our money, our time, our love. And set them to good use, Lord, that we may shine in our front line. Amen. Thank you, everybody, uh, for your patience with me <laughs> as I've come back to this. Um, uh, there's nothing left to do except to give the blessing, which today comes from Philippians. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. <laughs>